Hello and welcome to the Peter Mackay Motorsport Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. I really hope you enjoy listening to it. Today we're going to talk about Wales Rally GB that happened at the weekend and what a fantastic event it was. Um, I was very fortunate to actually get down to Wales um, for to see some of the rally uh, over the weekend, which was such a treat and to be honest, quite an eye opener for a relative novice to um, to the stages, and certainly certainly watching watching live anyway. It's been a long time since I've been at stage side at a rally. Mostly used to the the luxury of of the <laughs> of the the closed motor racing circuit where you've got the cars coming round every minute and a half or so. Um, so a totally different spectating proposition, but one that I enjoyed. Uh, immensely and uh, uh, I hope you don't mind but I have a a couple of stories to tell from uh, my time at Wales Rally GB and hopefully give you a little bit of an an idea of how different going to watch world rallying is compared to say going to watch British touring cars or MotoGP or or, or something like that so um, I packed up the car, parked up Francois, my little little Renault Clio, Renault Sport uh, and made the way down to the beautiful Welsh countryside, I mean absolutely stunning stunning place, um, not a single bit of flat ground in sight anywhere and I made my way down uh, on Friday afternoon uh, to the Slate Mountain stage, a very short special stage uh, in the uh, in Wales Rally GB to see the World Rally cars uh, come come through. Arrived at Slate Mountain where they were having, um, after that stage they were having what was called a regroup where the cars are bunched back together and then set off in their two or three minute intervals. Uh, where they can also it was a part of this part of the uh, rally where they were fitting the quite advanced front light pods to uh, to the cars to give them sight through some of the uh, early evening stages that would run into the darkness uh, at Wales Rally GB, which was which was very cool as well. But arriving at Slate Mountain and being liberated of thirty five pounds for a ticket, I have to say that that was. Uh, that was quite a painful experience, but worth it nonetheless to to get up really up close to to the stars, seeing Tana, and Ogier, and Neville, Mickelson, Craig Breen all coming through. And it's the first time I'd seen these brand new. Uh, well, I say they're not brand new anymore, are they? They're seeing these new era twenty seventeen spec World Rally cars, and they are absolutely spectacular to to watch. They're loud, fast loads of aerodynamics that just make them look so aggressive it's just a just a wonderful spectacle but after watching the guys come through slate mountain went down to the regroup stage and saw a lot of the wrc2 guys coming in peter solberg uh coming into uh to the regroup with his co-driver phil mills uh on his his um his farewell tour peter solberg which we'll talk talk about a little bit later on um after seeing Slate Mountain, went down to um, uh, Landudno, um, where the um, uh, where the service park is. So in in Landudno, it's a beautiful seaside town uh, in Wales, near the very famous Great Orm stage, and that's where all the teams uh, will situate their their garages and the team. Um, all of the team personnel will be based in what's called the service park, and that's where. The drivers will, will come back sometimes at lunchtime or will be out for the whole day and they'll come back at the end of the day for, for service to, to make any necessary repairs and any 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 changes to the car set up as well. So within the service park you've also got the um, the TV set up, the wonderful WRC All Live Studio is right in the middle of the service park. And again I, I've talked about an open paddock so many times on, on um, the Peter Mackay Motorsport podcast of late. and. The, a WRC service park is just such a hub of activity with all the cars, you'll see all the drivers, you'll see all the team personnel and you can just pick up so much more and it's it's something that I think that Formula One and MotoGP could learn so much about of having an, some form of open paddock where you can get a bit closer um, to, to, to the teams, to the bikes, to the cars. It makes such a difference of, of getting you more engaged with the, uh, with the sport. So it stayed stayed overnight in in Clandudno and saw the all of the drivers come in um, nearly well. What time did they come in? It was ne- ne- nearly ten o'clock at night, and they'd been out since the very early hours of the morning. So 
Wales Rally GB, one of the really long events, leaving very, very early in the morning and coming back in very, very late in the evening. And of course, when the drivers arrive back, they've got to debrief with the team, they've got to do media interviews, they've got to do, they've got to look over their pace notes for the next day, they've got to watch onboards. It's a real tough challenge. It's almost slightly old school uh, in that sense of Wales Rally GB. But um, when the cars were coming back, I saw, I stood at the Hyundai garage and watched watch some of the guys come in uh, and it was it was amazing to see the variation in body language between the three Hyundai men so Thierry Neuville um, battling for the championship um, Craig Breen um, making a one-off appearance with the uh, with the Hyundai team uh, and Andreas Mickelson um, uh, as as well and Neuville was first in and you know as soon as he got out of the car he was getting bit of a pat on the back from the mechanics, a little bit of chat, smiles, all good, no problem. And then Andreas Mickelson came in and the difference in um, the difference in body language was quite extraordinary to see. Mickelson was having a pretty decent rally and did have a pretty decent rally um, as, as well, but you could tell that just the, quite the atmosphere in the team between him and the team was not quite as strong. And as we'll talk about later in the podcast, the, the, the silly season in, of who's going to drive for which team uh, in the World Rally Championship is in, it's absolutely at fever pitch at the moment. So um, Mickelson is one of the guys who's probably in one of the most dangerous positions for keeping his drive for next year. Um, but um, so I wonder, maybe has a decision been made already? Because his body language, you could really tell that he was he was not. Uh, he, he, there wasn't quite the warmth around the team as there was with his. Uh, his stable mate Thierry Neuville, but very cool to see, and again, stuff that you wouldn't see uh, in a closed paddock um, motorsport. So Saturday morning, got up, packed up the car, and headed away nice and early um, from Landudno, and a hundred miles south, right through the middle of the Welsh countryside, absolutely stunning, to try to get to the Sweet Lamb stage. And on my way, and this is another thing that's so unique about rallying, all of the, the cars, um, to get to each special stage, they have to go along the same public roads that a lot of the spectators will. So it's not unusual to come up behind a, a full-spec world rally car with all the wings and covered in mud um, driving along in front of you. And I was very fortunate to, to manage to park up in a lay-by right behind Chris Meek's um, uh, world rally car uh, Toyota Yaris. And if you look on our Instagram page at Peter Mackay Motorsport, you'll see a picture of the back of uh, of, of Chris Meek's um, Yaris WRC and just how aggressive these cars look uh, up close. And it was fascinating to stand and watch and had a little, a very short chat with uh, with Chris and asked how he was getting on. And he said, "Oh, you know, lost a couple of seconds in that last one, but you know, we'll keep going." But it was you could just it was tense. You could really tell. There's not much chat between. Chris and, and Seb, you could tell right in the heat of, of battle, the nerves were going, um, he looked he looked stressed actually, he looked really, really stressed. And no wonder when you're in a, when you're in a battle and you're trying to hold pace with the three fastest rally drivers in the world, uh, hanging on to the coattails of Tanak, Neuville and Ogier, and I suspect that Chris Meek would have been told um, to hold station and, and take manufacturer points because on Friday, um, the other Toyota of Yari Mati Latvala um, had rolled and broken the roll cage, so he was out of the rally. So with two guys needing to score in the manufacturer's title, which is between Toyota and Hyundai, so close at the moment, um, I think um, team manager Tommy Mackin would have said to Chris, Chris, just calm down and just, just, just bring it home. Uh, and he did that job perfectly kept the pace to come home in fourth position but also bring home those those valuable manufacturer points. So so that was that was a cool thing to see, just to be able to, to, to see and you know, them squishing the windscreen and cleaning all the mud off and getting the car ready. And I managed to actually follow Chris out of the uh, out of the lay by to the next stage and watching watching a world rally car driving on public roads going around roundabouts and things. It's just the most bizarre thing, but the really, really cool. And one thing that you will only ever see in rallying and what makes rallying so, so special. 
One of the other, however, <laughs> one of the other unique things about rallying is is spectating and getting to the stages and the time required to to make it to the stages. So I thought I'd got up nice and bright and early, six o'clock in the morning. I was up and I was away by half past six from um, from the service park in Landudno, and I thought, oh, I'm going to be no problem. I'll be down at I'll be down at um, Sweet Lamb to see the cars come through at eleven o'clock. No problem at all. Well, how wrong was I? Wales Rally GB in it is has been such a popular event for so long, but I think at the moment rallying is is getting back to 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 the glory days of twenty years ago when it was live on BBC Grandstand and stuff. I actually think it's really really popular now, which is great to see. However, it was so popular that all of the car parks for the Sweet Lamb stage were full, and the police blocked off all the roads. And I thought, oh dear, this is this is a bit of a game stopper here. So went back up the road trying to find somewhere to dump the car and was very lucky to found a lay-by and spoke to a couple of gentlemen I said are you going to the stage and they said oh yeah yeah we are uh, I said do you know where we're going and they said well I think it's up that road I said oh, do you mind if I follow you and they said and they, they didn't sound very keen and uh, they said oh yeah okay and they actually they just off they went into the distance and I struggled to keep up with them and I thought that was a bit unfriendly I even offered them even offered them a wee drama out the boot of the car but no that wasn't that was that was to no to no avail however my fortunes um turned very much for the better very quickly after walking right up what felt like a vertical mountain to try to get over to the sweet lamb stage um uh, a very nice bright blue um Skoda Kodiak VRS went past me and parked up uh, at um a gate that was closed in front of us and I, I, I thought, oh, here's a chance, and I, I popped my head in the window and said, I said excuse me, I said, sorry to be very cheeky, but could I, um, are you going to the stage? He says, yes, we are. I said, would, 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 would you mind if, 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 if I jump in with you? He says, sure, absolutely, hop in. Um, he says, you couldn't get that gate, though, so open the gate, and, and I went. So I um, got chatting, and it turns out this chap, a guy called Paul Wedgbury, um, is the owner of a Skoda dealership, Fiendtree Skoda in Telford. And turns out that he was a, he's a, a rally driver himself and used to race in the um, the Mitsubishi Evo Challenge. And he was telling me all about his new Skoda R5 car with Subaru World Rally Car running gear that he's getting delivered. And we had a we had a, actually we had a wonderful day. And what my luck was really in when it turned out that Paul had an access all areas pass on his car. So basically, we eventually managed to drive all the way up right to the side of the stage at Sweet Lamb and got a perfect view and saw most of the cars coming through on both passes. So it was just such a wonderful day and it was great to spend the day with a fellow rally enthusiast and a, and a, a guy who's, who's, who's competed at a, a pretty high level as well. So Paul, thank you very, very much um, for your hospitality and your help. Um, I really appreciate it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have seen much rallying at all on Saturday at Wales Rally GP. So anyone looking for, to buy a, a Skoda, get yourself down to Faintree Skoda in Telford. Hey, is that our first endorsement on Peter Mackay Motorsport? Oh, it might be. It might be. Um, very cheap. Just give me a lift to the side of the stage and you, I'll, I'll give you a shout out on, on the podcast. <laughs> um, so, so that was, that was, um, that was the, the adventure of going to, to Wales Rally GB and really, really enjoyed it. But now we'll talk about the whole rally uh, it, it itself um, as well. The rally itself was won by the imperious Estonian Oit Tanak, who this year has been just a very much a cut above the rest. And this has been coming for a while, you know. We've seen Oit Tanak even two years ago in 2017, won a couple of rallies alongside Sebastian Ogier and played a very good supporting role to Sebastian Ogier, winning his, his world title with uh, M Sport in 2017. Uh, but in 2018, um, going to Toyota, really stepped up again, nearly won the championship last year, um, if it weren't for just a few mechanical failures. This year, he's had a f quite a few mechanical uh, blunders, um, which have been no fault of his own. Um, in fact, he even had to battle with a couple of kind of um, issues with his Toyota Yaris WRC uh, in, in Wales, it's, you know, loose bodywork and things like that. Um, it, that car is doing everything it can to, to take this championship off him, but uh, my goodness, Oit Tanek has just been incredible this year, and he just, all, right through the rally, he just seems to be able to just build, build, build. He, he just steadily comes out the blocks, and then just through Friday night, he just turned up the pace even more, and through Saturday, he just kept putting on pressure after pressure after pressure. 
And it was really interesting watching Sebastian Ogier, who eventually came in in third, 23.8 seconds behind Oit Tanak, which is not very much when you consider, <laughs> you know, a 22-stage rally with a couple uh, being cancelled. And Sebastian Ogier, most, most of the stage end interviews followed a very same pattern. Um, you know, he'd get stopped at the stage end and he would get interviewed by either Colin Clark or, um, or Kelly Bloor or, or whoever. And they would say, you know, what, what can you do? I mean, how c can you catch Tanak? And he, he, just, he just said, oh, I can't go any faster. I'm, going, I'm absolutely on the limit. I cannot make, make this car go any faster. And um, it... It's hard to say, I mean, um, is, is that a machine issue? Possibly. Uh, but I just think that Oit Tanak's just in a right, in a purple patch of form. And I, I, I genuinely, um, after the disappointment of Turkey in the last round, where he had a, an electrical failure, which took him out of the rally completely, and Ogier went on and won uh, and, and took a lot of power stage points as well, um, you thought, oh, this is getting close now. But Oit Tanak made sure... Uh, that that was that that was was put to bed. And last time on the podcast, I mentioned um, how important the uh, the power stage points would be, um, and it turns out that they are going to be very very important indeed. Because in the power stage, um, Sebastian Ogier absolutely dropped the hammer, and I mean absolutely tore through um, the the final power stage, and looking like he was going to have maximum points. Um, from the power stage, a maximum five points for first, which goes all the way down to one point for for fifth. But Tanak, leading the rally, you know, knew that even though he was leading the rally, he still had to go on maximum attack, and he went and won the power stage to get a maximum thirty points. And that stage alone could have been um, the actual pivotal moment in the championship. I think that is. Uh, I say that's Oit Tanak's um, Great Arm moment because last year in the championship, Sebastian Ogier coming over the Great Arm stage really took a huge chunk of time out of everybody and won the rally, and that ultimately gave him the, the you know boosted him on to go and win the the world championship. It was that was, but I think Tanak's power stage win at Wales Rally GB this weekend was I think just as significant as the rally win itself because it's just that moment to say. I have just got that little bit of pace in hand when I need it. Um, and by doing so, he now holds a 28-point lead over Sebastian Ogier. Now, 28 points, we've still got two rallies to go. So there is, in theory, there's still there's 25 points for each win and potentially five power stage points from uh, in, in each rally as well. So there's still 60 points left on the table. So any mechanical mistake... Um, for, or any mechanical error or, or failure uh, in from Tanax Toyota could could cost him the championship again. Um, so he's he's definitely not out of the woods. But all things being equal, no mechanic fingers crossed, no mechanical issues. Then I think we're we're we, we're going to see uh, Oit Tanak claiming the title for the very first time, and it will signify a real switch in fortunes. You know. Sebastian Loeb win nine titles in a row, and then we've had Ogier win six titles in a row. To see Tanak come in now, uh, it, it really does open up and just sets, just exemplifies why this is such a golden era of rallying that we're experiencing right here, right now. We've got brilliant drivers, we've got brilliant cars. You know, we've got cars that we've got the, the Ford can win rallies, the Citroen can win rallies, the Hyundai can win rallies, the Toyota can win rallies. Now, it wasn't so long ago that a Volkswagen was the only car that could win rallies, you know, so it's 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 wonderful and I'm just enjoying it so much the this WRC season. So Tana, yeah, one hand on the trophy, um, but it's never over until it's over. Now, Thierry Neuville, he really impressed me at the weekend. Only 10.9 seconds off the win. He was pushing Tanak all the way. It would have just taken one slight mistake from Tanak and Neuville could have won the rally. But he just, just, just that little bit behind, plus 10.9 from Tanak. So, so close. And But what was really interesting was that Thierry Neuville only scored one power stage point um, and Sebastian Ogier scored 
four. So actually, even though Neuville hit, finished ahead of Ogier in the rally, they scored the same amount of points in total. So again, these power stage points are so, so important. Um, this, that, the, the power stage is the last stage of the rally. A lot of guys, they've got to think about protect. It's, it's fascinating. They've got to protect their lead. They've got to protect their position. But they can go for the extra points if they want to take the risk. And, or some guys who have come, they've maybe re restarted the rally in rally two, they can just go very slowly throughout the final day and then drop it drop the hammer and go for it uh, in the uh, in the final power stage it's a such a good creation um uh, for the excitement of the the world rally championship so Thierry Neuville himself he's 41 points behind so it looks like it's going to be uh, a two horse race between Tanak and Ogier but it's going to need Tanak to, to, to stumble. Remember, he has not made one single mistake of his own yet this year. It has all been mechanical error that's got... Otherwise, he would have won the championship by now. But let's wait and see. I think we've, we've got Spain, um, Oi Tanak opening the road, and then we've got Australia. So if Ogier... The one thing that Ogier can do is if Ogier can win Spain with maximum power stage points, and if Tanak is maybe off the podium then Australia becomes completely different because if, with Tanak opening the road in first uh, in the championship, as he likely will do in Australia, uh, and uh, with Ogier in second on the road, just that difference can make all the difference because within the World Rally Championship, the championship leader always starts the road order. So the, the cars are released in sort of three or four minute intervals and timed over a stage. And if the on a gravel rally, uh, if the if you are opening the road, you're at a great disadvantage because if you can imagine a gravel surface, every car that goes through, it's sweeping away all the loose gravel and exposing the nice grippy road underneath. And that's basically what the road cleaning does. So eat the further back in the order you are, um, so if you're maybe fourth or fifth in the championship, like Andreas Mickelson or Chris Meek, uh, you've got a big advantage over the guys in first and second. So that could play havoc. So Australia being the final round of the year with the road, the way that the road uh, position is going to play in, it's going to be oh, it's going to be fascinating. I can't wait um, to see it. So what else did we did we see in the uh, in the, the Wales Rally GB this weekend? Well, I want to talk about my man of the match. Tanak was an obvious one. He was. Uh, almost not a surprise how good he was at the weekend. But I want to I want to give the man of the meeting the spirit of the rally award to Elvin Evans. Elvin Evans has spent the whole summer trying to recover from what must have been a very very nasty injury um, that he um, that he he picked up at Ra with a huge crash at Rally Estonia just at the end of July. So he's been out of competitive action for well for 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 two and a half months or so. So a lot, that's a long time when all the other guys have, have had a few rallies in between. Um, only got to do a little bit of testing in the weeks before uh, Wales Rally GB, but he got straight into his Fiesta WRC and showed he was his pace all weekend was right up there with Panak Neville and Ogier. Right up there. Unfortunately, on the, on, on the I think it was the second or the third stage, I can't quite remember, he just clipped a bank and um, had a little bit of damage to a wishbone in, the, in his suspension, um, which he had to straighten out on the road section and still managed to keep pace for the rest of the day, which I have no idea how he managed that. Um, and he, he lost about 45 seconds um, or so in that uh, stage where he had that little little um, altercation with the bank. And he, he finished in fifth place in the rally overall, only 48.6 seconds behind Oik Tanak. So without that, it's all if, buts and maybes, but his pace, if you looked at his pace, many stage wins over the weekend and really showed just how special he is at Wales Rally GB. And it's such a, it's almost a, oh, such a what if situation how Elvin Evans, he could have really been in, in contention for that rally win. And even if he'd had a full season, that would have been impressive. Impressive, but to come back having not run um, a competitive rally since the end of you know the end of July was absolutely fantastic. I was I was in the service park on Friday night and I 
So his, um, his father, Gwyndath Evans, a very accomplished rally driver in his own right, um, having a chat with um, David Evans, the Autosport and Motorsport News, um, and the you know, top rallying journalist in the world, having a chat about it. And they were, you know, David Evans was saying to Gwyndath just how impressed he was with how quick um, Elvin had been considering his lack of seat time. And I'm sure that he's not 100% fit yet either. Um, I'm sure he's still still in the recovery stage but just about fit enough to get into the rally car so um, Elvin definitely gets my star performance and also shows um, just how competitive that Ford Fiesta package is and I suspect that the legacy of um, Sebastian Ogier being at the team over the last two seasons before this um, have really had an effect on just how competitive that, that package is. Now what else did we? Who else did we see at Wales Rally GB? Well, we saw Craig Breen getting a another drive uh, with the Hyundai team after a brilliant showing in Finland, where he was actually asked to uh, in Finland to to step back to allow Thierry Neuville to come past him in the order to help his championship chances, which um, does your um, does your favour in the team no harm at all. So he got a he got his drive at uh, um, Rally GB, uh, where he's had a lot of success in the junior categories in the past. Um, and there's good strong rumour that he may be in the car for Australia as well. So let's keep our fingers crossed that we're going to see Craig Brain in Australia and hopefully for next season in WRC as well. Craig, again, a little bit like Elvin Evans, showed really good pace throughout the weekend, but unfortunately one mistake uh, just cost him. Brain's mistake was a, had a little bit more spectacular circ uh, spectacular. Um, Consequences than than Elvin's um, on the um, the middle of the middle of the second day um, came around a left hander just a slight missed pace note a little bit wide and a, a four I think they they counted four and a half barrel rolls off the side of the road and through the the kind of wet boggy grass but by some form of miracle because the ground was so wet the car actually took very very little damage the wheels were all straight. Row cage was fine, um, just a just damaged bodywork really. The car landed back on his wheels and um, losing about four or five minutes or so, albeit, but the, the Craig Breen and his co-driver Paul Nagel managed to get going again, get the car back on dry land, <laughs> get it back up onto the road and continue the rally. Which And their pace, even with a car that was reminiscent of something out of Mad Max, um, managed to get themselves to the end of the end of the day and 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 finish the rally uh, as as well. So Craig Breen's showing just how determined uh, he is and just how how strong a rally driver he is. Even all rally drivers have have big accidents over over the years. That was certainly a big one, and and, he, and thankfully he him and Paul Nagel got away with it. I I I just sincerely hope that doesn't damage his chances of getting signed up for a proper WRC program next year. Now, last thing before we talk about next year and, and who might be driving for who, I want to talk about the family Solberg. We saw um, quite, an, quite an extraordinary um, set of circumstances where we saw Father Petter Solberg, the 2003 world champion, and his co-driver Phil Mills and concluding their farewell tour, so Peter Solberg has announced that his his competitive rallying career is coming to an end, and um, he's gonna he's gonna slow down his activity in competitive motorsport and take on new new challenges. So part of his farewell tour was was this run in Wales Rally GB in his uh, VW Polo uh, GTI R5 car, um, racing in the WRC two class. Uh, along a lot with in a very very busy field uh, of top level WRC two cars, Hayden Padden was in there, Mads Osberg, Cali Robin Perra, Jan Kopetsky. The R five field was Gus Greensmith as well. The R five field was absolutely packed full uh, of fast drivers, and Peter Solberg, absolutely amazing in his final event in a, at Wales Rally GB has seen, been so kind to Peter over the years. That was where he clinched the world championship back in two thousand and three. Where he's won rallies there before, uh, it just has been very, very kind indeed to him. And a lot of the, I think the British rally fans have really warmed to Petter, like many sets of rally fans around the world. But Petter finished off his WRC career in beautiful style 
by winning the WRC2 WRC category and actually only 45 seconds behind Cali Robin Perra, the winner in the WRC2 Pro category. So the specification of those vehicles is the same. It's an, what's called an R5 car, um, which is a slightly more basic version of the full World Rally car, um, about 280 horsepower or so, um, but a, a, a very sophisticated car nonetheless, just not quite as sophisticated as the World Rally car. Um, but the, Pro, the WRC, T, WRC2 Pro entries are entries that are in, entered directly by a manufacturer team like Skoda, uh, Ford or Citroen. So Peter won the, won the WRC2 category and what a lovely way to conclude his time. He couldn't think of a more perfect way to conclude his time in world rallying. But his son... Oliver Solberg just turned 18 years old, only passed his driving test a couple of weeks ago and to get his license to complete the road sections in Wales Rally GB. Well, he had a, he had an up and down weekend and unfortunately just in the second stage he had a mechanical issue which took him out of much of the weekend's action. However, uh, in stage 18, he was, he was the stage winner in WRC2 and also in stage 19 as well. In both of those stages, he was faster than Cali Robin Perra, who Cali Robin Perra just turned 19 and is tipped to be the future WRC WRC star. Looking like he's going to win the WRC to, WRC2 Pro Championship this year, and very much part of the conversation of World Rally Cars uh, seats for next year as well. So for Oliver to come in on his first ever WRC Rally and have two stage wins once it when his car was working showing that he has absolutely all of the raw speed um to to be right up there so fingers crossed that we see Oliver Solberg in a full time um, WRC2 program this year i think um someone like a, a Skoda or an M Sport Ford would be very very clever to get Oliver Solberg in their car for a full season of WRC2 action next year but what a lovely thing as well for Peter can you imagine for a father that when he won his world title Oliver was still a toddler he was only two years old when when Peter won his his uh, his world title and to see your son at 18 coming in with a lot of expectation I mean there, there had a lot of attention I saw Oliver in the in the service park and he was just getting hounded by every tv camera every interview and he handled it very well and for a guy who's only just turned 18 years old it impressed me very very much and the pressure of being Peter Solberg's son as well must be immense and um, it will open doors for him of course um, but the, it carries a lot of it, weight of expectation as well. But um, over the couple of stages which he did run uh, over the weekend, once the car was working, um, he showed all of the raw pace, and I just can't wait to watch the young man's career. And I think the rivalry that will appear between Robin Perra and Solberg will be fantastic, and it will not be long before we see the two of them battling each other at the very top of the sport. So... Next year, WRC Silly Season. Silly Season is basically when all of the teams are now deciding who is going to drive for them next year, who's in what car, and there is a lot of drivers who are who are who are contracts are, are up in the air. So what do we know up to now? Well, Citroen is solid. Citroen is going to have the same lineup as as this year. We're going to have Sebastian Ogier and we're going to have Esapeka Lappi in the two Citroen World Rally cars for next year. Will they come in with a third car next year? Nothing has been said about it. Who knows? Perhaps if someone could come up with the money to pay for a third car, possibly. But let's let's wait and wait and see there. But I would expect that it will just be Sebastian Ogier and um, uh, and Esipekalapi. Now, what's a lot more uncertain are the other teams in the service park. So Ford, Toyota, and Hyundai. Just this morning, uh, it's been announced that Danny Sordo has signed again for Hyundai next year on a one-year contract, and he will re he will um, compete over seven of next year's fourteen rounds for Hyundai. And combining with Sebastian Loeb, who has signed for six rounds uh, for Hyundai next year, I would suspect that they will be they will be dovetailing uh, in a car to, together. Now, Hyundai has been one of the most complex discussions in the WRC silly season because in every rally 
um, Hyundai will be running three cars, and um, that's been the case for, for quite a while now. Um, Thierry Neuville is obviously running a complete full programme and is their kind of their chosen driver to go for the World Championship, for the Drivers' Championship. But the other two cars have had an absolute, you know, real musical chairs of drivers coming in. And you, you've got Andreas Mikkelsen, um, who's had who's been dropped for a couple of rallies this year in favour of Sebastian Loeb and Sordo in some cases as well. Will we see Andreas Mikkelsen get a full-time programme with Hyundai next year? I don't know. It's been interesting. Andreas Mikkelsen has come under a lot of criticism that he's not up to the job and he's not performed as well and he's not been as on the pace with the Hyundai. But if you look at his championship points and you consider that he has been dropped for a couple of rallies. He's actually sitting in fourth in the championship. He's ahead of Chris Meek by four points. Now, being in mind that Chris Meek has had a full programme and Mickelson's been dropped for a couple of rounds. So if you think of Mickelson, the points he might have gained in that time, he would have been quite far ahead of Chris Meek. Um, so I actually think that he, he's, he's done... He's done an OK job, actually. He's done a pretty, given a supporting role to Thierry Neuville. But I suspect the Hyundai are wanting more for him and more from him and it might be that he's maybe looking around the service park and seeing if there's opportunities elsewhere who knows we will we'll just need to wait and see it's so hard to tell um the the you obviously you'll hear lots of little rumors coming up in the newspapers and motorsport news and autosport and so on but um who, who knows we've, we've got craig breen what's craig breen going to do is he going to get a few more rallies with hyundai next year let's certainly hope so that he gets um, um, yeah, a full-time program would be fantastic, but um, even even a shared program with Sordo, with Loeb, or with Mickelson would be would be would be a great improvement on 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 this year as well. Toyota, well, Toyota they hold, or should I say more more correctly, one of their drivers holds the absolute final piece of the jigsaw um, for the driver market for next year, and of course that man is Oi Tanak. The championship leader, the man looking set to win the World Rally Championship, and the guy who's been undoubtedly the fastest driver uh, of uh, of of the season so far. And there's been all sorts of chat about what he's going to do next year. Um, his manager, Marco Martin, has been seen having long discussions with Malcolm Wilson, with Ford, and Malcolm has done nothing to cool the speculation there that he's interested in going to in going to Ford now. In terms of Ford, it's not, of course, it's not Ford, it's M Sport. It's Malcolm Wilson's own company, M Sport, that are the entrant in WRC. It's not a full factory effort like all the other teams in the World Rally Championship. So Toyota is directly from Toyota head office. Hyundai the same, Citroen the same. The M Sport Ford is M Sport enter the team, they run the team, and they get a little bit of support from Ford, but probably not enough to um to really compete with the the financial might of Toyota and Hyundai and for that matter Citroen, you know o Sebastian Ogier openly said that he would have loved to stay with Ford uh, to stay with M Sport and Malcolm Wilson, um but uh, I think the the offer from Citroen and the 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 promised um resource that was going to go into the Citroen program was too much for Sebastian Ogier to to say no to so. If you know if uh, M Sport and Malcolm Wilson are serious about getting um, someone of the caliber of Oid Tanak, they are going to need significant funding from um, from Dearborn, from Ford Performance, from Ford Head Office, and with Ford, they, you know they're 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 cutting back a lot of their motorsport activity at the moment. That could play in one of two ways. That could just be an overall strategy where they're stepping away from motorsport in general, and that is not going to play in the favor of. Um, uh, of M Sport in the context of the World Rally Championship, or it might be that they go well. We're being quite successful uh, in the Ford in the World Rally Championship, and it's a a category of motorsport that really interests us. It's going to go hybrid in a couple of years. That's very interesting, and that might be that what they're looking towards. And then more investment comes in. Let's see. I sincerely hope so because. Clearly that Ford Fiesta is one of the top cars in the service park and with a driver like Oid Tanak behind it, well, stand back and, 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 and watch out. Remember, it's won the last two drivers' world titles with Sebastian Ogier on board, so who knows. But I suspect that Oid Tanak might stay where he is because I think that financially staying at Toyota, I'm sure, would be more advantageous. And clearly, 
that Toyota program is one hell of a focus program. The car has definitely got the fastest, you know, out and out pace. It's maybe a little bit fragile as we've seen, but it's a very, very well well funded program and very well run by Tommy Mackinnon as well. Now in Toyota they have three cars as well. Um so at the moment you've got Oit Tanak, you've got Chris Meek, and you've got Yari Mati Latvala. Now a rumour refuses to go away that Cali Robin Perra may be coming into the Toyota WRC fold next year. Now, whether that's in the factory team or as even like a kind of satellite privateer entry, it's not entirely clear. Now, what happens with Oit Tanak, whether Oit Tanak leaves the team or whether Robin Perra comes into the team, have really those are two very important pieces on the chessboard to um, Chris Meek's um, chances for a full-time drive next year and also Yanni Mati Latvala. And with Yanni Mati Latvala, um, you know, leaving Wales with his um, Yaris WRC on its roof in a Welsh forest, and with Michael, uh, with Chris Meek, you know, coming in in a very strong fourth place and playing the team game very, very well, well, the, just at the time, the timing of that will be very, very uh, important. And But I suspect, just judging by Chris Meek's body language all weekend, I suspect that, that that decision has not been made and you can cl- you, um, Chris Meek was a lot less relaxed than you might normally see him. He looked tense all weekend, he looked nervous and I suspect that's because he knows he's, he's, he's um, competing for uh, his drive next season. I suspect that over the next few weeks as we come into Spain and, and, and into Australia as well, a little bit might become uh, come a bit more clear uh, in the next little while. So let's see, let's keep our fingers crossed for all those guys. Um, it's competitive, it's really difficult. You know, we haven't even talked about Hayden Padden. Hayden Padden, a very, very accomplished driver, was very unlucky to lose his seat at Hyundai, I thought. He's a rally winner. Um, you know, he seems to be, you know, slowly but surely making closer and closer ties with M Sport Ford. He will be coming to Australia with an M Sport Ford and he will have a fantastic road position. He'll be right at the back of the field and um, so the road will be sweet, nice and clean for him to come in. And so, yeah, so watch Padden and can you imagine if Padden comes in and wins in Australia? Oh, oh my goodness, that would throw a cat amongst the, a cat amongst the pigeons. So lots to play out and maybe by the time we talk to you next, um, about WRC, we might have seen a few more pieces on the chessboard move around. Now, there's one last thing uh, I want to talk about before we sign off. It's a long episode, 40 minutes, goodness me. Um, is some incredibly sad news this week that the print publications of Autosport and Motorsport News and F1 Racing will be will uh, cease to exist in the very near future. Now, Motorsport Network that own these titles have made the decision that the platforms will go online and with um, podcasting and so on and so forth. Um, but to see the print editions of these iconic titles, particularly Autosport that's been around for generations, uh, to see the demise of that is incredibly sad. You know, when I was when I was a kid, uh, I remember running down to um, you know begging mum to take me down to Gary's newsagents and um, to get the weekly instalment of Autosport magazine. And that Autosport magazine was an incredibly important factor in my growing love of motorsport and what still lasts to this very day. I mean, I used to read Autosport cover to cover um, and to, to you know watch, and that, those were in the days of like the British Touring Car Super Touring and reading about you know Rickard Rydell doing the double at Croft and reading this page to page and it was you know, and you would you would have like the these this was in the days of Tommy Mackinnon and Colin McRae going head to head and Autosport covered it all and I, I just loved it and it's so so sad to to seeing it um, to see its demise. It will carry on in another guise. Whether it will carry on in the same way, I, I don't know. But it's uh, a very very sad news uh, in, indeed, and has quite an effect on the reporting of uh, of rallying uh, as 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 well. So very very sad indeed. Uh, I really hope that it doesn't involve any kind of cutbacks or job losses for the, those that work at the publications. Hopefully their uh, their efforts will be deployed into into the new new media platforms. I really hope so because the talent, you know, in autosport and motorsport news uh, is is about as good as it gets in motor motor racing journalism. Quite you know, people who I look up to massively. So I'm very sorry to hear about that and some, some bad news. But 
let's look ahead. Let's see what we're going to see in the rest of the World Rally Championship. Two rounds to go. Tanak versus Ogier. It's advantage Tanak, undoubtedly. But as we know in rallying, absolutely anything can happen. For those of you who haven't seen any of the World Rally Championship or maybe interested about it now after listening to this podcast... Go on to your either Google Play or um, Apple Store, a podcast um, uh, app store, that's what it's called, excuse me, and type in WRC All Live and give the WRC All Live subscription a go. It's about £8 a month. Get it for the final two rallies of the season and just you can watch every single stage uh, live. You can also go back if you've missed the stages live. You can go back and watch every single stage. And I love the service. Bex Williams and Julian Porter and all the team do such a good job of just bringing the rally to life and bringing the service park to your mobile phone or to your iPad or to your television. They do a wonderful job, so support that. It's a great service and and check it out. And I think we're going to see a fantastic end to the season. So, but before I go, um, please don't forget to uh, subscribe to our channel. Um, you on Podbean, you go on there, click subscribe or click follow, uh, and then once you're once you're subscribed. Your, your phone or your device will give you a notification whenever a new episode is published, so check that out. Um, you can follow us on Facebook, uh, which is Peter Mackay Motorsport Podcast, uh, on Twitter, at Mackay Podcast, um, and on Instagram, which is at Peter Mackay Motorsport. So check all of those out for a wee bit more stuff from, from me. So thank you very, very much for listening to this episode, and I can't wait to speak to you again about some more motorsport action. Thank you very much.